Okay, uh, it's 2.50 and I think we can get started. So thank you everyone for joining and taking time this afternoon to hear a little bit about how we can scale the name node and what are the lessons learned from the field. Um, and I hope you are having an amazing ApacheCon uh, so far uh, on the first day of this virtual conference. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I'm currently working as a manager uh, at Cloudera. Um, and on the side, I do happen to contribute to Ozone and Hadoop projects, so hold some titles there. And my contact details is listed here. And um, please do not worry um, about taking notes or noting something down that's there on the slides. I will share all the details on the chat. It's all posted in a GitHub repository, so you can access them offline. I would rather prefer uh, that you interact with me, share your stories and lessons learned from uh, the usage of Hadoop as we go along in this talk. All right, um, so today we'll talk a little bit about what are the common problems that we face and what are the typical causes of those problems that we hear in the HDFS world and uh, what are some guidance that we can uh, make use of to overcome those problems. Okay, so some of the commonly reported problems are, uh, you know, if you want to categorize them uh, into broad categories, that would be performance and stability, right? And when it comes to performance, we hear most of the time users complain about, I mean, it's the administrators actually who complain about the RPC processing time being too high or the name node is, uh, you know, experiencing a lot of long GC pauses. The read write performances begin to get impacted and it takes too long to start the name node uh, if they are doing a you know patch upgrade or a maintenance uh, activity and things like that and from a stability standpoint uh, the service is you know not functional uh, not at all operational so you hear issues like there's a lot of frequent failover happening between the ha instances of the name node or there is frequent crashes happening and sometimes the failover is so bad that when the transition is going on from standby to active for the only node alive, that node also crashes. So that basically brings the entire system to a halt. Now, these are some of the commonly reported problems. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive list of all the problems that users and administrators report when using HDFS. So let's take a look at some of the common causes. I mean, the first one, small files, uh, it's, uh, famously infamous around the globe after 10 plus years of Hadoop uh, that, you know, small files cause more havoc uh, in the system than it was originally perceived because it, you know, adds the pressure on the name node metadata because name node stores all that metadata in the memory. So that's obviously one of the common cause. Uh, then we often land a situation where there is a lot of suboptimal heap settings. Now, uh, in my job role at Cloudera, I often deal with a lot of the premier customers. Uh, you know, who get an expedited level of service. And more often than not, uh, you know, seven out of 10 times, I come across a case where the name node is not performant. And we take a look and find out that, you know, they're having a lot of GC pauses, long GC, so their heap settings are not optimal. So what happens is, um, you know, as the cluster grows, as people drop in more files in the cluster, there is no sort of check and balance in most places to, you know, go and revisit their current file or block count and then see if the name node uh, heap settings are optimal. So often there is an issue and that's when they realize, oh, we have an increased, you know, 50 million or 100 million files since we last upgraded uh, the heap size, right? And um, as I work with a lot of these premier customers and a lot of the other large scale customers at Cloudera and trying to support them in their analytics and distributed systems journey, we've come across the scenarios that Hadoop itself is not to be blamed completely, right? So the Hadoop community over the last 10 plus years have worked really hard to bring in a lot of performance improvements, to bring in some excellent features that, you know, help it scale at that level. But then, um, you know, like a lot of the op open source projects, uh, I would say the sales pitch is not very strong, right? And so that what happens is, a uh, lot of these important and you know useful features that are built are not uh, marketed too much 
as a result, only the Hadoop ninjas tend to know it, right? So think about the people at Cloudera, uh, LinkedIn's, the Yahoo's, and the Ubers, right? These are the folks who contribute those features. They obviously know which ones to implement, but the larger world, um, you know, doesn't take time to read the open source pages of Hadoop and see what is new and what you know new features can they add. And of course, the other motivation for not doing that is, you know, they all have a support contract with somebody, right? Whether it's Cloudera or uh, any other company in this business. So they tend to, you know, just log a support case and just, come, you know, talk about that. Oh, I'm having a problem in my uh, name node performance, right? So we will also, you know, later in the talk, see a lot of these RPC improvements, right? And then comes the obvious ones like the bad applications, uh, mistuned components, right? So Hadoop alone doesn't get impacted by itself. Uh, HDFS doesn't alone get impacted by itself. You have components like HBase, uh, like Hive, like Spark, who end up basically storing files on HDFS and then talking to HDFS. So that also has a role to play, as we will see uh, in detail uh, later. Then obviously we have the uh, degraded group lookup performance issues um, either too frequent checkpointing, which means your you know write operations are put on hold until the checkpointing is complete, uh, or you have a too delayed uh, checkpointing. So a lot of uh, edits actually wait to get merged to the uh, FS image file. And uh, common another common behavior that I've seen across a lot of customers is due to either the budgetary reasons they may end up co-locating a lot of heavy services. So Think about name node having co-located with, um, you know, Hive Server 2 or your edge based master and region server or the YARN resource manager and things like that. So then the name node host is obviously uh, basically in contention with all these heavy services and some of them are very heavy on IO, some of them are very heavy on CPU. So your name node basically has to fight for all of these. And then that also results in a lot of disk throughput issues if name node is sharing the disk with some of these services or even with the OS itself. Then is the question of uh, too much logging. Of course, you know, uh, sometimes people turn on certain logging classes uh, for debug purposes and forget to turn off. That creates a lot of logging. And even when we use audit logging um, and some of the other kinds of logging that we have in HDFS, um, it's not fine-tuned by default right out of the box. So that at a scale will cause problem. In ordinary clusters, you may not see those problems happening. And lastly, we've often seen that there's a degraded communication between the journal node and the name node, or say the name node and the zookeeper. And obviously the name node thinks that, I mean, there's no quorum, so okay, let me flip. And so that causes all those sort of problems. So we, we'll take a look at few guidances. Obviously, this uh, talk is not meant to be, um, you know, a replacement for, say, a professional services engagement who would come and basically iron out the cluster for you. But this is uh, going to focus more on what is already available out there in the open source community on the Hadoop developed features, but not utilized either because they've not been publicized well or you know, there's just not enough content about it uh, out there in the web, right? So first we'll take a look at optimizing logging. So there are a few things in logging which um, uh, has been my go-to advice to most customers when I pick up their cases and I see uh, too much of logging spew happening, right? So one of them is, uh, you know, disabling the get file info audit logging. So of course, for that to happen, you should have had your audit logging enabled in the first place. And when that's there, uh, you would want to disable the get file info audit logging because that does a massive amount of logging. Then comes the concept of async logging. Uh, so if you turn on the name node audit and name node edit logs and make it all async, that will reduce the pressure on name node to a large extent, uh, especially at scale, you would not see logging being a problem in under 200 nodes in averagely busy clusters. But the moment you go beyond 300 nodes and you have upwards of 400, 500 million uh, blocks and files, right, things just begin to get out of hand because you have say 10,000, 20,000 odd Spark jobs and then another 20,000 edge base Hive jobs uh, running in the cluster at any given time. And the amount of logging that can be caused is uh, just mind boggling. Then comes the 
state change logs, right? So you have two special kinds of logs that get uh, you know dumped into your name notice, the state change and the block state change. So every time a file's state changes, every time a block's state changes, uh, by default, it is, I think, at info level. So, you know, you wrote a block. Yes, there'll be a log for that. Uh, let's say Hive is trying to delete a temporary file it created. There'll be a log for that. So all that is not necessary for you. So, you know, you can tone down that logging from info to, say, warn. Or if you are want to be too aggressive, you can, you know, bring it up to error uh, even. Because that is the only time you would need those logs. If you are investigating an issue, you would only want a warn or maybe an error log. But definitely, you don't want to see the info log. So that will reduce a lot of logging. So next comes uh, the optimizing of the RPC. And this has been one of my favorites because all the four features that are mentioned on this slide, right? These are nothing new, nothing created in 2021. As far as I can recall, all of these basically exist right from 2014, 2015, if I'm not wrong. And yet, uh, you know, in my four years at Cloudera, I cannot even count how many times I've gone on a customer support call uh, on an HDFS escalation. And when we debug their performance issues, then we take a look at their configs. Um, eight out of 10 times, we find that all four of these improvements are missing uh, in their cluster. And this is something you know that nobody should have to pay for because it's out there in open source world. Like if you just go to the Hadoop documentation site, all of these features are listed there with full design documents and explaining how this benefits uh, the cluster. So I'll talk briefly about you know all of these. So service RPC basically, what it means is uh, it provides the cluster a dedicated port for the data nodes and the Zookeeper failover controllers mm -hmm. to talk to name node which means the clients and the applications will not use that port to talk to name node. So thereby you are segregating the traffic uh, that comes from data nodes for block reports or for you know heartbeats and things like that. So that will take away a lot of your load from the you know same RPC queue because right now, if you don't have it enabled, everything is just going through one RPC. So you don't want that. It's like a, a traffic jam, right? So. Then comes the congestion control. Um, congestion control, like, I mean, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the um, whole TCP protocol, right? How it works and how when the stack is busy and if new requests comes in, it's it will just ask the you know client to go back. So basically the RPC congestion control in HDFS, what it does is it, the way it has built the client is the client will automatically uh, rethrottle and submit the request uh, at a later time. So that kind of wards away all the congestion that may get created on the queue. Um, and then you have the RPC call queue implementation, right? As I was mentioning earlier, before you implement and enable service RPC, everything is just one single RPC queue. Uh, so your clients, your data nodes, your applications, everybody is talking through one line of communication, one. Uh, you know, track, so to speak. So if you have such RPC enabled, you've put in congestion control, you might as well enable RPC call queue. So what RPC call queue will do is uh, it will allow you uh, to have multiple RPC uh, queue implementations, right? Uh, so thereby you can um, set various other advanced properties and then segregate that traffic again furthermore. And lastly comes the data node lifeline protocol. And data node lifeline protocol, I found it to be particularly helpful when you have more than uh, 200 odd nodes, uh, 200 data nodes in a cluster. Anything under that, I've seen customers survive reasonably well without the data node lifeline protocol. But anything over 200 nodes, uh, I have absolutely seen them struggle a lot, especially when their cluster is at um, you know peak usage. So what is data node lifeline protocol in short, uh, the Lifeline protocol basically introduces a lightweight messaging system to send the block reports to the name node, right? So it's a lightweight messaging protocol using which the data node will send the block reports um, to the name node. Then um, you'd have to deal with a variety of host level issues uh, day to day because 
um, the scalability problems in name node doesn't always come because it's mistuned or because you know you have bad users and things like that so these um, you know issues are something that is very very common i see it on a daily basis right so how to deal with the host level issues basically what you want to do is if you have journal nodes and name nodes co-located you don't want to share the disks ideally i mean of course there are budgetary constraints uh, which you know users might have and they sometimes tend to do that but if your plan is to have a very large cluster and expect same performance and scalability uh, issues minimal uh, then you would want to have dedicated disks right uh, for name node and journal node uh, then is this is uh, this has obviously been one of my favorite recommendations to most customers is please do not co-locate heavy services like high server to edge base master or region server resource manager etc on the same host as name node you are basically creating a situation of survival of the fittest uh, on that node and the first person to basically crash would be the name node and if name node crashes everything else is you know going to be useless in the cluster so often i have seen situations where uh, high server 2 and name node are co-located on the same host and um, hs2 is taking really long time to uh, get the queries being processed and all because hs2 is io heavy and that puts the pressure on the disk and to make it worse they were sharing the disk with name node so that is something you do not want if you want to have a large cluster and still be performant. Now, the other uh, properties that I'll talk about is not really to do with the Hadoop side of things or you know general host side of things, but it's more on the how your infra team builds that host and gives it to you so that you can install Hadoop. So one thing is called CPU scaling. So in most large data centers, the idea is that you set the CPU scaling to the power saving mode because obviously it consumes a lot of power and uh, you know you want to operate in a eco-friendly way or you know you want to have lower electricity bills at the end of the day, right? So, but for Hadoop, uh, you definitely do not want to be operating the nodes on a power saving mode. You want your CPUs to be operating in a performance uh, mode whereby the performance is given priority so it will consume more cycles and thereby it will consume more power so and you want the name nodes to be functional so of course basically that cpu scaling should be turned on for every node other than the client nodes or the edge nodes as you call it other than that if you have any node where you have a hadoop master service installed you would want to turn the cpu scaling to performance rather than power saving and of course, lastly, there is um, the transparent huge pages. Uh, you you definitely want to keep it disabled. Now, the one thing that I've come across pretty often is all these settings are in place for a customer, right? And they go ahead and do an OS patching, right? So let's say they go from rel 7.5 to rel 7.6 on a Sunday. Monday morning, they start reporting performance issues, memory issues, CPU issues, and all sorts of things. And of course, we are checking about, oh, what has changed? Oh, nothing has changed. We only did a standard OS patching, even the JDK didn't change. And then you spend a lot of time to come to the conclusion that uh, in your OS patching, some of the kernel configs got tweaked, got updated, or you know, got set to values which are not optimal. I've also seen cases where the OS patching has basically enabled uh, THP, and there were no checks and balances in place to keep a tab on these kind of things. So if you want to run a scalable name node, you want to work very closely with your infra teams and ensure that uh, the OS patching doesn't inadvertently change any kernel level parameters uh, without you know consultation from the Hadoop team. That can actually relieve a lot of pain post the OS patching because you spent two, three days on you know a lot of war rooms and a lot of Zoom calls uh, only to figure out that you know, it was by mistake, somebody flipped the kernel properties. So you don't want to be in that kind of scenario. Now, next is, yeah, I mean, any any large Hadoop deployment basically obviously wants to be secured and most of them, you know, use some sort of um, group lookup mechanism, most popular being the Microsoft Active Directory. 
uh, the LDAP and things like that. So since name node, uh, every time you submit a request to name node, the name node has to go and find the groups associated with that user, which means the name node relies on the performance of group lookup activity, right? The group lookup call. Oftentimes we see in the name node logs a statement called, you know, something like potential performance problem user so and so took XYZ milliseconds. And then that is an indication of either a degraded Active Directory or a dig you know communication between the name node and Active Directory is degraded, right? So one of the two things. But in either case, it is not really a problem with the name node, right? Name node is just doing what it was supposed to be doing, is that go and fetch the groups for this user. So sort of a band-aid, sort of a you know, breathing room or a buffer room, you can call it. Um, you know, these three other advices that are here, right? So you can increase the group cache time also. By default, I think it uh, name node caches it for about five seconds. Um, but you can obviously you know, go and increase that cache time out to a little bit longer um, so that it doesn't have to hit the AD or the group lookup call so often because it will cache the group details. Then you also want to increase the negative cache timeout. So negative cache timeout basically comes in handy if you have users who do not have any associated groups with them. So which means that by default, doing a get groups call for them is actually pointless, right? So you can increase the negative cache timeout. Thereby, if the user has no groups, uh, it will hold that in the cache for longer and will not make that call. And then, um, you know, you always have specific users in a cluster whose details do not change, meaning the groups that they are associated with do not change. Say, for example, the service users or the administrating uh, users, right? If their groups do not change, are going to pretty much remain what they are on day one versus what they are on, say, day 365, you might as well go ahead and add a, a config uh, using which you can provide a static mapping override for those users. So that will ensure that for those users, it will not go and you know keep doing a get group call every time that service user submits a job uh, in your cluster. All right, so now comes the another hot area, which is failover and startup performances, right? Um, so for failover, obviously you want to have an optimal value for your HA health monitor or popularly known as the ZKFC timeout. By default, I, if I recall correctly, it is about 45 seconds. But then again, uh, the question is, if you have a cluster which is way beyond the scalability by the general scalability limits of hdfs right you have 500 million files and you have six seven eight hundred nodes stuff like that and and let's say you guys do not have a hadoop ninja working in your org right um so you you may want to bump the zkfc timeout say to about at most 120 seconds instead of 45 seconds but this particular config tuning is a double-edged sword right you keep it too low uh, your failovers will happen too frequently. Even if it is not necessary, it will end up triggering a failover. You keep it too high, in the event of an actual failure, what would happen is it would take that much longer to eventually declare that, okay, you know, now is the time for failure. So you, you increase the ZKFC timeout in extremely small increments, and, and it's going to take a while to find the sweet spot for any cluster. There's no... Sadly, there's no rule of thumb or a formula that you could deploy and say, okay, I have X number of nodes and then what should my value for ZKFC time would be? It's more a matter of finding what works for your cluster um, given your situation. Then we have uh, improvement in place to speed up the quota initialization. So every time the name node has to boot up, it has to read the FS image, it has to recompute all the quota parameters. And uh, that takes a lot of time. So there is a certain property uh, in the Hadoop configurations uh, added via a certain feature. What that does is it allows you to specify how many CPU threads, basically parallel threads, you want to use for this quota computation initialization activity. Now, I have seen a lot of users and customers be afraid to bump that value to 
uh, say default value is four, so they are afraid to bump it to eight or sixteen or thirty-two because they fear that oh, if it takes up, you know, if this particular process takes up so many threads, uh, so many, so I, I will have a CPU contention or resource contention uh, on that host. But see, the beauty of the way this feature has been built is that those extra threads that you're allocating are only used during that time of quota initialization, which will only happen when you are starting the name node. It won't be used uh, throughout the life cycle of, I mean, after that throughout till the end of the life of name node, right? So it is only used during startup. So it is absolutely safe. And there is a guideline on how you can go about increasing that. And lastly comes the throttling of FS image transfer bandwidth. Now this we learned the hard way. Um, you know, I was working with our cloud engineering um, and dealing with one of a large customer. And in their case, what we found was they had a very large FS image. I think it was about 65 gigs um, FS image and it was not in a great shape, uh, so to speak. And the whole cluster itself was, um, you know, had a lot of uh, files like uh, I think it was about 750, 800 million files. Uh, they had about 400, 500 uh, nodes and um, pretty much all the data nodes had region servers co-located and uh, even the region distribution per a name node, I mean, per data node was uh, too bad. So given all that, what would happen is every time there'd be a failover, uh, the latest FS image is, you know, being, or even during the life cycle of HDFS operations, when the FS image has to be transferred from say active to standby or either ways, it would use the maximum bandwidth it had available uh, to do that transfer. As a result, sometimes the name node would kind of be busy with that activity and would freeze up and not respond. And that time the ZKFC timeout would think uh, that, uh, hey, this name node is probably dead. It's not responding to me, so let me fail over. So that, that also would trigger a lot of failovers in uh, some of the scenarios. So the default value is zero, which means you are gonna use maximum bandwidth that you can get in your network, but you, know, you can throttle it and then you can try to limit it to 50 Mbps per second, 100 Mbps per second, whatever works for you in your cluster. The idea is to not just go with unlimited. You know, that's basically the crux of that advice. And uh, bonus situation is, um, if your use cases in the cluster are such that they do not need to know the last access time for a file in HDFS, right? Then you should go ahead and uh, turn off an access time precision uh, in the HDFS. Because what happens is if you have the default value, which is it will track the last access time, every time that file is accessed, name node has to go and light, write up edit log entry saying that, hey, this file was accessed two minutes ago, for example. So that extra entry uh, will get, you know, uh, will not be needed anymore. And so you can turn it off. But I've come across customers who also end up having a use case where they need to see the last access time. So sadly for them, they cannot turn it off. But if you don't have such a use case, check with your apps team and just turn off that property. It will uh, reduce the number of edit log entries the name node is making simply. All right, so we've talked about a lot of things and, and we certainly want to talk about heap as well, right? And I think heap is a very debatable topic. Um, every ninja, Hadoop ninja that I speak to, they all have uh, you know, a different rule of thumb using which they want to decide and arrive at a value of heap that they want to use. But in general, most of them would agree with, you know, what is written here on this slide deck. And this is part of what you can use also to communicate to users why small files are bad, right? So typically a namespace object in the name node world occupies about 100 bytes, 150 bytes of memory. And let's assume for the sake of the discussion that your name node's block size is defined as 128 MB. Now, if you have a, one single file, which is of size 128 MB, you end up with two objects. One is your file ID node and one is your block. And since we said each such object will occupy 150 bytes, that comes to 300 bytes of memory. Now, uh, take the other scenario. You have one MB files in the system. 
and you have 128 of those. So basically you're storing the same amount of data on the storage, right? Whether it's 128 times one or one into 128, right? Either way, you're storing the same amount of data. But now you have 128 files of one megabyte each. So you end up with 256 objects and that comes to like a little over 38K bytes, right? So that is insanely large compared to the 300 bytes in the previous scenario that we discussed. So the guidance here is that if you want to calculate and come up with a value for heap, you want to take into account the blocks in inode. That seems to be the more reasonable approach rather than just counting the number of files. Because as we just saw in this example, number of files can sometimes lead to uh, suboptimal heap settings if you take that as your rule of thumb for calculation. Um, again, that's just the rule of thumb. A lot of things also dictate the size of heap is the use case, what kind of jobs are gonna run. Um, so one GB for every million blocks should be a very, very conservative and good rule of thumb uh, to start with. And from there on, you can either scale down or scale up as needed in your situation. All right, so block reports, of course, as you scale your cluster, you add more data nodes and thereby the problem is that a lot of these data nodes will end up sending block reports. Your name node is already busy, already stressed, and you see lots of error messages in log, which say, or even in the data node logs, you'll see, you know, block report queue full, you could not send the block report and stuff like that. So as you scale, um, you know, it is the duty of the administrator to ensure they don't burden the name node by too many block reports. So what you want to do is you want to split the block report by volume instead of, you know, okay, this data node has 20 volumes, send the block report for 20 volumes all at once. You're just going to choke your name node because you don't have just one data node, you have like 400, 500, 600 data nodes. So that's definitely a good way to go about it. You also want to reduce the frequency of how often the data node sends a full block report. So that will help. And then to counter that, what you can do is you can batch your incremental block reports. Um, again, there are properties how to use this and how to control this, but that is the general guidance that will help you minimize the pressure created by the block reports on the name node itself. Uh, managing external factors, yes, you have to control small files. Um, and this has been a never ending battle with the end users versus the administrators. Uh, but yeah, you know, you still have to try to do that. I've often come across applications that run a du command on an HDFS folder. Uh, and that is very expensive uh, call to make. So advise the users to use ls instead. Um, there is a property which controls the maximum file, I mean, block replication that you can have, right? The file replication you can have in HDFS. The default value of that max replication is an absurdly high number of 512. If you have an HA cluster, a replication of three does just as good a job a replication of 512 would do. Yet some banks and financial institutions want a replication of 10. That is still okay. But imagine if you have a default of 512 and you have a bad actor, right? <laughs> They're gonna misuse this and go launch a repl replication for 500 for that file. It's just going to create more havoc for you um, to deal with it. So consider reducing the value to something more reasonable like 10, 15 or 20 in your cluster so that even by accident, somebody doesn't come and sabotage your efforts to keep the cluster running and functional. Uh, then if you use components like Hive and Tez, you want to tune in those properties in those components to ensure that the intermediate output files are compressed or merged. You have ACID compactions enabled if you're using ACID, uh, you know, uh, so that the data files get merged with the base file on the tables. If you're using Spark, uh, make sure you turn on the Spark history cleaner so that once the period and the intervals are defined, it will clean up the files older than that specified period and they won't accumulate in HDFS because those are just event logs and uh, those are going to be really small files. Uh, YAN, of course, log aggregation is a no brainer. Um, and then if you are using EdgeBase, you have to be very careful about choosing the region split policy because that can dictate how small or how big a region files it will create, which eventually are files on HDFS. And then you should deploy in some kind of a script, some kind of a tool 
to merge size zero regions. Basically, those are just empty files lying in HDFS. They all count towards your small files. And lastly, this one is again my favorite. If you do not have a data retention policy in your organization, please push your business leaders and come up with a data retention policy. Because if you want to keep that data forever, and if it is not even required, you're just keeping files on the cluster for no reason. And that's adding to the pressure on the name node metadata in their memory. So that is basically what I have um, in this talk today. And whatever we have discussed, right? I know I did not really take you to the actual configuration that you have to enable um, uh, you know, to put in all these guidances in place, right? So for that, what I've done is I didn't want to make it a whole boring in a tech session such that you don't you know, enjoy listening to this. So I put all of that detail in, a, in this GitHub here. Um, and let me open it up a bit and show you to you. So whatever we discussed, all those things are put in very detail over here on how do you go about uh, editing that and you know setting those properties. So all of them are here. I will leave this in the chat and I will also add the slide deck uh, to this GitHub repo that I have. Now, I know we are running out of time, but yeah, if there are any questions, I will definitely go through some of them here. Um, but if you do have questions after the talk, you can definitely reach out to me on LinkedIn, or Twitter, you know, email, whatever, whatever mode of communication works for you. I am uh, accessible in most places. Let me even put uh, this in the chat for your reference. Um, so I see a comment from Matt. Many deployments start with co-located services on host, absolutely, uh, for budgetary reasons. By the time they realize the performance impact, the ecosystem has become quite diverse that it is already difficult to uncolocate the services without a lot of opportunity. Absolutely, that because co-locating the services is not, I mean, um, you know, uncolocating it is not an easy job. Um, there's a lot of finances involved and then you have to go through a round of certification, internal testing, auditing, validating. Uh, so that definitely takes a toll. But uh, if I, I if you are managing an open source cluster by yourself, I could understand it would be so much more difficult. But you know, if you traditionally used HDP, CDH, or even the modern day CDP that we have at Cloudera, the, uh, moving the services are very easy. You can do it from the management console, whether it's Ambari or Cloudera Manager. Uh, they both support uh, you know doing that. But yeah, that's that's absolutely right. That is what I was hinting at is the budgetary reasons why people don't end up doing that too often. And there's an anonymous question. Is JVM map pause still a thing? Should we mount uh, slash temp as temp FS on the name node? Um, you could map a temp, uh, you know, slash temp as temp FS on the name node. It shouldn't be a problem. Um, definitely JVM map pause is a still a thing, absolutely. All right, I think we are just two minutes away, but yeah, I'm, I'll just hang around for another two minutes if there are more questions. But yeah, I appreciate all the comments. I appreciate all of you guys taking this afternoon um, to talk to me, uh, to you know, hear from me. Um, and then, yeah, my goal really was just to highlight some features that have existed in HDFS for a good number of years, but haven't been publicized, uh, I guess, to the extent that it should have been. And that is where I just wanted to double click on this. What do you okay? So there's a question from Andrew. What do you think should change to make sure these features are public sized going forward? So there, that's a very good question. Uh, in my opinion, the thing is, um, every time we write such a new feature, um, we could maybe do a blog as, as a community, we could do a blog. Or if let's say someone from Cloudera is contributing that feature, or someone from Uber is contributing that feature, or Yahoo, right? They could write their own. They could write a small article on their engineering blog. That could be one uh, way to look at it. Uh, the other way uh, I think it could happen is 
even if you are not able to get hold of your own engineering team and get a blog written internally at your organization if you are a contributor by all means write a personal blog share it on linkedin share it on twitter you put in the right hashtags and then you see people would just want to come and look at it and see like okay what has andrew got to talk about scalability today right what is andrew going to talk to about name node what feature did he is talking about right so everyone gets excited um if they have the same intention of learning more about scalability but yeah that is a that is a very good question i do thank you for that um some of you have thanked and appreciated for the session so thank you very much uh, thanks to you for listening patiently all right i guess my time's up uh, and uh, i have other talk on ozone on thursday and if you are interested in scaling beyond the hdfs limits join all our talks on uh, ozone Thank you and have a good rest of the apache con bye bye